Have we overestimated Mueller? That's a subject, one of the many subjects of our show this morning. Trump Week. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Tim Apicella, Cynthia Sinclair. Hi, guys. Good morning. Good morning. On the way in, I was listening to NPR. They're talking about a report from the Senate Intelligence Committee or to the Senate Intelligence Committee. You tell me more about the fact that the Russians hacked all 50 states in 2016, the year that Trump won. The age of Trump, the age of hacking, it's all the same. Partially hacked, but mostly they've been basically walking by the storefront waiting to case the place so they can break in. So these weren't they successful. The they they the weren't successful hacks into yeah. the voting machines, but they were they were definitely targeted for hacking. All fifty and states. They got the voter registration correct. information. Yeah, they got they got all bunch of information. They got the whole country. They, they got the voter information. Yeah. This is scary because, as you say, it's in 2016, arguably, and we don't know everything yet. They're still working on this. It's elusive at best. Um, they, have the, they have the voter registration, and, and that means they're preparing for something else. You know, walking by the storefront in 2016 and 2018 and, and 2019 and 2020, yeah. um, we're going to have more. The operative point in this, Jay, was it's not so much that they can change the votes. They could just get rid of the database of voters. So if, if you select areas where there's a high African-American population and just exclude that database of, of voters, you've successfully hacked, um, hacked into it and then eliminated most likely a, a Democratic vote. How do you do that? How do you do it? Yeah. I couldn't begin to tell you. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> this is what these guys do. Is this scary or what? I'm terrified by all of it. Absolutely. And what they do is they just remove them from the rolls. Yeah. So when they go in to vote that day, they can't vote because they're not registered anymore. And Trump said that he was inviting help from uh, other countries. Right. And so, I mean, I, what I get from that is he, he had plenty of help from Russia in 2016. Mm -hmm. And he knew it, called for it. You know, I mean, they, they don't have a smoking gun on him actually doing this. But personally, I believe, I morally believe that is exactly what happened. Um, and he's trying to do that again in 2020. Ergo, there, was, there has been no action by Congress to protect against this in the 2020 election. And in fact, what happened? Uh, uh, there was a bill, and the bill got stopped. More than one bill. Right. And McConnell stopped it. And the Republicans aren't sparking up because there's no pressure for them to spark up. They, there is absolutely no political pressure from their constituents about this. So Mueller says the one thing that he was clear about there were not too many things he was clear about. There was one thing he was clear about is that, you know, the United States has to do something about its voting system. Um, how do you feel about that, Cynthia? And why don't we do anything? I don't know why we're not doing anything. And I have been crying for election security from the very first time I was ever on this show. And down in the South, where I've just been for the last three weeks, they could care less. They think everything's just fine. Everything is fake news except for Fox News. They're going to vote for Trump again. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm getting nauseous. I'm slightly nauseous. <laughs> I may have to take a break after a while. We just started. You can't take a break. Okay, yeah, no, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay Mueller. This is the week of Mueller in large part. That's why we titled the show, Have We Overestimated Mueller? We don't seem any closer to impeachment. Um, you know, that's sort of collapsing it. But the fact is that Mueller, to me, was a disappointment. How do you feel about it? Well. It wasn't a disappointment because it's exactly what I expected. Um, have we overestimated? No, I didn't. Um, there was prosecution. You knew there this was, was going to happen. Was, it, per, there was predictions that Mueller wasn't going to be an exciting witness testimony. They knew that he was going to stay within the four corners of his report. They knew he was dry and, and factual and very uh, curt in his responses. This is no surprise. And I don't know who thought this was going to be the John Dean moment um, for... <laughs> for this presidency and this administration, but it clearly wasn't, and what, who thought it was going to be? The, the estimates vary from anywhere from 125 to 200 questions that he failed to answer. And I was looking at it as a, you know, as a lawyer, as a litigator, um, to try to understand why he, you know, um, an excellent litigator, a man with a long-term career in litigation, and if there's one thing that uh, defines a litigator is get the answer to your question. He wasn't giving answers. He was dodging question after question. I was really disappointed with that because I thought if there was one thing that would happen here is 
He would be an honest responder. He wasn't. Well, he, in, in my view anyway, as I was watching him, he responded to all the Democrats' questions almost completely, except for the things that are still being investigated right now. And he was clear to state that that is a current investigation. The thing that I noticed with maybe part of those 200 that he didn't answer, all the Republicans, because all they wanted to do was talk about the FISA warrants and the, the Steele dossier and all that stuff. And he's like, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about that. So more what I noticed was that he didn't answer the Republicans' ridiculous questions. And, and he did answer every time there was a part of the report read to him, he answered with, yes, that's well, correct. This is consistent with what you said, Timmy. He right. was going to stay within the four corners of the report. Right. I mean, I don't want to call it a nothing burger because there were some benefits out of it. I think there were. But modest. Mm -hmm. But what were the benefits? Well, they were succinct questions to and with responded with succinct answers. And there were yes and no. But they were, you know, Jerry Nadler and um, Adam Schiff were able to state really within the five, five first minutes of each session um, the questions that needed to be asked and the answers were obtained. For example, um, did the Russians interfere with the, with the election? Yes. Um, were there contacts from administrative staff to the Russians? Yes, 127. So the, the salient points in a, in a 448 page document was capsulized within five minutes of the first session and within five minutes from Adam Schiff in the second afternoon session. You know, everything else, as far as I'm concerned, could have just been, you know, eliminated. Well, the problem is that when you have some jewels among some mush, um, you know, the public and the press doesn't really get the jewels so well. Um, you know, so are we closer to impeachment? Uh, you know, uh, since you commented on that, I, I mean, what, what's your view of it is? Oh, are we closer? No, um, not at all. Um, in my mind, if, if anything else, it's, it's taken the air out of the balloon. Uh, because. I think there was an expectation, and your title says it perfectly, there was an expectation that this was going to be an aha moment. And it just didn't appear in this. And, you know, again, we have a five-hour testimony here. It, you know, the, the attention span of the American public has gone from the days of Watergate, where it was days and days and days of fascinating testimony, to now five hours, and they can't digest that. Yeah. So you need the executive summary on everything going forward. And if you don't have an executive summary, don't bother. And if you have an executive summary from William Barr, you have lies. You have lies. And not only that, but he did a great job of taking his lies and basically uh, portraying them to sway the American public, in particular yeah. the Republicans. Yeah. Well, since Cynthia, <clears throat> is impeachment dead? No, I don't believe it is. But I'm very frustrated with Nancy Pelosi because she seems to be dragging her feet. And the fact that we are in this much of a crisis in our country and they're going on break just angers me completely. Yeah, how could they go on how break? How could they go on break when our country kind of... is in a state of where it is? It's just insane to me. It makes me want to fire all of them, fire all new ones. And because it's just, to me, that's just outrageous. See that, that building behind us, you know, nothing going on. Yeah. That's what it is. And, and, you know, on a daily basis, we pay millions and millions of dollars yeah. to have those guys legislate. Yeah. But they're not legislating. Well, Jackie Spear, who's on the Intel Commission um, Committee, excuse me, um, she basically said, if this doesn't happen by September, it's not going to happen. Oh. And she also said, you know, stop talking about like we might do something. We either to do it or not do it. Because right now, they look weak and, in, you know, and indecisive. They, yes. yep. they can't make a decision. And uh, there's nothing worse than, you know, having one of the greatest churns of seats in the, uh, the House uh, in the 2018 election to basically hire a bunch of indecisive, you know, know-nothings. Right, who fight among themselves. Yeah. Right. yeah. That, was, that, was, uh, that was not very promising. Not, <clears throat> not, it was promising at the time, but it's not promising now. Okay, uh, so let's talk about, um, <laughs> this is your, your point, Tim. Uh, wiping Afghanistan off the map? What's going on here? Well, I mean, it was a bizarre Monday of this week. It was a very bizarre turn of events where you had the prime minister, um, Imran Khan, who's the prime minister of Afghanistan, sitting you know, in, the, in the chair next to Donald Trump. And Donald Trump says the following. I mean, it's really, really, I mean, before I say what the quote is, here's an example where we've, we've become so accustomed to outrageous behavior. 
that when something like this is mentioned, it's not even newsworthy. We barely hear about it um, because we're in, you know, we've just it's been, a new normal. We've, it's a new deplorable normal, and we've been desensitized to outrageous words and behavior. So here's the quote. Donald Trump on Monday, if I wanted to win the war, of, win the Afghanistan war, Afghanistan would be wiped off the face of this earth. It would be gone. It would be over literally in 10 days. I just don't want to kill 10 million people. Now, if this was That's the commendable, if this was the Obama administration, the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, come on. I mean, this would be like a outrage, a, an outrage of. What are you saying? Well, you know, how could the President of the United States talk like that? Well, because he's got some, some mental issues and he's going to keep on doing these things. And it goes to the answer you just gave about impeachment. You know, there's a fair chance he's going to do something really crazy uh, before we get to the 2020 elections. I mean, and, and it's going to be so crazy, even crazier than his comments about Afghanistan, <clears throat> that, that maybe Nancy will change her mind. But let's talk about the British tanker in the, in the Gulf of Hormuz, okay? So we're supposed to be defending. We're supposed to have ships and planes and whatnot over there um, to defend the, you know, the shipping lane in the, sh in the Gulf of Hormuz. And yet these guys with a relatively small boat, or the Iranians, are able to take a, a, British, a British tanker. I mean, <clears throat> in a tanker, it's a, you know, this was not a big tanker, but it was nevertheless a tanker, and they were on the radio talking to each other. They could have been spotted by any number of, um, you know, radar and sensor, uh, you know, technologies, um, but we let that happen. Well, why do we let that happen? What's wrong with us? Well, if you go to YouTube and just write hijack tanker, you'll see live video footage of 50 caliber machine guns stationed on many of these oil tankers, most of them, and these, these hijacks don't take place. I guarantee you it's a very graphic, uh, you know, it's a horrific uh, demonstration of what 50 caliber machine guns can do to an oncoming boat. Um, why, this, why this tanker wasn't protected is beyond me. Why didn't the U.S. step in? This is our best ally. This is an ally that Trump sees as his best. And now that, what's his name, Johnson is involved, uh, Boris Johnson. Um, gee, I mean, uh, don't you think the U.S. could have stopped that attack? It's rhetorical. Well, the, 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 if the proximity of the ships were there, I'm not sure they could have. Yeah. Well, they are there. You would think remember, so. You would hope so. Remember, uh, yeah. Donald Trump said something. He goes, you know, we don't have a big interest in the, uh, st uh, the Strait of Hormuz anymore. We're producing enough oil in the United States for us to take advantage of. So fold up. That's what it is. Every time you get a chance to be nationalistic and, um, you know, an isolationist, yeah. then fold up. That's what happened, I think. That's basically what he said, not, yeah. not long ago. I'm sure to a moral certainty that he knew about this attack. Uh, the Army, the Navy knew about this attack and could have done something, but the military chose not to or was instructed not to. Really too bad. Yeah. Uh, and now uh, the British look weak, and so do we. Um, okay. Well, they didn't look weak when they confiscated Iranian's tanker <laughs> previously. <laughs> okay. Well, and that tat. was a major tanker. Tit for tat. But, you know, well, no, 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 no. And it wasn't tit for tat. They, they confiscated a major tanker. The one the Iranians took was a little, a little baby tanker. Okay, okay. All <laughs> so, right. okay. Let's get our facts so straight. So who's, who's winning the Iranian confrontation? Well, Iran. Yeah. Because of the world of popular opinion. Yeah. You know, they're being picked on by these superpowers and... They were, you know, trying to implement the agreement in which they were, you know, engaged in. And the United States pulled out of it. And the United Kingdom is following suit to, to back up the United States. So it's, they're being bullied. Do we have a chance of having a war there? I think we do. Yeah. Oh, it's, There's it's, a chance of winning a war there. Well, if you, <laughs> if you ask Trump, he'll just wipe it out. Wipe out the whole place, right? So he thinks he will, and I believe he will if we do go to war. Well, war he will use nuclear us. weapons if we go to war. One of our earlier shows it was entitled uh, So Glad We're Not at War. That was on the, the, uh, the Trump Week um, OC16 show right. we just put up for broadcast. Um, so um, if, you know, if there's a war, what's going to happen? How, how would the U.S. fare in such a war? Uh, how would that affect uh, our relations with other countries? How would that affect, um, you know, this country and the views of the people in this country? 
I believe that he will use nuclear weapons and end it just like that, as fast as it starts. And then who knows where we'll go from there. But more nuclear weapons will come at us, and it will be, that's what I'm really scared One of. One thing leads to another. But yes, exactly. Oh, that would break every agreement, international agreement we have about using any nukes anywhere, anytime. Yeah, but he doesn't, but he doesn't stick, care about the he, rules. He doesn't stick to the rules. He, you know, he rewrites this, them this in is his a good own point. way. And it, this actually pertains, I'm just going to take a quick turn to back to the Mueller thing, because he talked about Article 2 and his executive powers. Right. This is a direct quote. And this, this will be the overall umbrella of to why he does what he does when he does it. And it's, the quote is this. I'll do whatever I want as president. I have the right to do whatever I want. Now, he means that. Right. Now, I don't know if that's through that's the advice. That's not the law. No. <laughs> That's his perception of Article 2. So let's get back to, right. you know, breaking all international treaties about right. the use of nuclear weapons, even if it's small, you know, a small dosage nuclear weapon. Right. Um, that's his guiding principle right there. Yep. And I believe he wants to. I believe he's wanted to go to war since he came into office because he's been picking fights with everybody all over the world. Because well, a wartime president is easily reelected. Right. Happens over and over. A wartime right. leader in any country. It's a great way to get elected, too. Right. Uh, you need me. You need me to prosecute this thing. You can't stop now. Uh, right. But let me shift a little bit and, and talk about, uh, you know, the kinds of things that happen behind his back. While you get these headlines uh, and while everybody's focused on Mueller and all this, uh, he's busy with other things that sort of slide by. Okay. How about, uh, through William Barr, a change in the policy on the death penalty? Oh, yeah. We're going back to the 12th century, rapid speed. Mm -hmm. um, they want to put some guys to death. Uh, and a, a change in the federal policy would apparently let them do that with, with federal, uh, federal victims. Federal, uh, I shouldn't say victims. Federal felons, right. federal convicts. Um, so what about that? Where does that fit? What does that tell us? And, and, and in light of the fact that he calls for his adversaries to be jailed, where do, we, where do we go from there? And he's got an attorney general, you know, who, who is, does his bidding and who causes prosecutions or doesn't cause prosecutions at Trump's, at Trump's instructions. This is very scary in terms of uh, who he might arrest, who he might prosecute, who might be convicted, and who might be put to death now. We've answered this question many times on this show. Donald Trump is the sole proprietorship of this government. That's, I mean... That and the quote I just read about, I'll do whatever I want when I want. And there are no checks and balances that, uh, until we get these things into the court. Now, he just got blocked in the court. What did he get blocked on? Wasn't it for down the south of the border, some issues about re-trying to define asylum? Okay, so here's a case where a check and balance did work. The asylum redefinition that he was attempting to do was blocked by the court. But until it gets to the court, it's whatever I want when I want. Yeah, and meanwhile, he's stocking the courts, stacking the courts left and right. So that decision may not be the same in a year or two. Uh, very scary because, of course, you know, it filters up. And all his, uh, you know, candidates, his, his, his judges, uh, uh, you know, presumably are loyal to him. That's what he wants. That's what he asks of them. And so we can have a different result next time this comes well, up. We basically have a year and a half left of this administration. If there's another four years on top of that, you will see a great change in the composition of all the judicial court appointments. I think yeah. we'll see it already. We don't have but to we wait have, for but, another four years. But how much more right. will take place Oh, no, it will be years, radically changed. Years. I don't know if it will be able to be fixed and brought back to norm. Because if we have an extra four years, it will be so radically changed that it will not be able to be fixed I, I again. I agree with you, Cynthia. You know, one thing I want to say about Barr and Mueller, and I know it's kind of off topic here. But to go back to, you know, everybody's been complaining about how Mueller was very, you know, um, 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 he was confused and blah, 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 all this other stuff. I don't think he was confused at all. But um, he wanted to make sure when he answered that he was answering what exactly they were referring to. So I was thinking about it while I was watching all these people, you know, just, you know, um, complain about how Mueller was so uh, hesitant and confused. And I was thinking about Barr when he went for his hearing and how he did all of this um, uh, um, uh, acting like he would, didn't know, acting over and over like he didn't know. And I, only he was acting, right? 
Yet nobody said anything about that. They how let him through. Hesitant he was, and how much he put on this big show, and the same thing going back. Um, you see lots of people that are coming forward for him that, when they're asked a question they don't want to answer, they um ah. Uh, um, they act like they're confused. Well, he turns out to be a complete instrument. Yeah, exactly. You know, in case there was a question, during those confirmation hearings, there's no question anymore. I think you've answered what I was going to ask you. Let's, let's you move know, on. Can I just hit one point about Barr? Because, yeah. as we know, with, with his executive summary, before the report was released, the Mueller report, um, he did all the damage he needed to do. He got on the choir to say, I've been exonerated. No collusion, no obstruction. Those are the only three things he had to do. You know? So the bottom line is, there's a great quote from a uh, representative, Sean Patrick Maloney, in uh, Democrat in New York. This is a great quote because it matches exactly what Barr had, had done. And that is, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth puts its shoes on. Wow. And that's what exactly <laughs> that's Barr that's did. That's what is happening over and over again in this administration. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about Powell and the Fed. You know, Powell, the Wall Street banker, Powell, at first it seemed to me that he was independent. He was a Trump appointee. He was independent. He wasn't, he was going to, you know, determine the, uh, the interest rate uh, as he saw uh, the need to in the Fed uh, to control the economy and incentivize the economy. And he, he was, uh, was going to take it up and take it up because it needed, the, the economy needs to be restrained at that point. Things are good, apparently. Um, but now he's saying, no, he's going to take it down. And the operative, the operative piece in the middle is that Trump is criticizing him bitterly because Trump wants to take it down. Trump wants to speed up the economy. It's a cheap speed kind of thing. He wants to speed up the economy, get some more out, squeeze it for more, okay? And he thinks he can do that by forcing Powell to reduce the interest rate. And now Powell is, is acceding to that. So he's changed his mind here. So just as Barr is an instrument, I'm beginning to question Powell. I'm beginning to question everyone in the Trump administration as, as taking instructions from Trump, even when they shouldn't be. What do you think? My first thought is, how does this happen? How do independent agency leads, particularly the Fed, which has nothing to do with you know, following the President of the United States and what it ought to do, um, how does that happen? How does Powell... Start to play ball. I will say one thing, though. I mean, there has not been the indicators of inflation. I mean, wh why does the Fed tighten, you know, money supply? Because inflation starts to rear its ugly head. For whatever reason, that's not happening. And so that, I don't think that's a case for reduction of interest rates, but I think it's a case of leaving, leaving them where they're at. Well, we'll see what Powell does, but it scares me. Because if you, if you reduce them now, and this, and this economy yeah. really isn't what it seems to be, then it's going to crash and burn. I mean, we have, we have mm -hmm. a serious problem in the fisc here. Um, we, we had the Tax Reform Act of 2017. Uh, it did not do what they promised. It, was, it went right through the Congress, which was all Republican at the time, uh, without a single hearing, without you know, any real transparency to the public. And now, and now, as Ryan said, like a week after it was passed, Ryan said, oh, too bad, we don't have enough money. And indeed, we have a huge deficit. The Republicans, they're not supposed to do this, the Republicans have turned, uh, turned around completely and have created this huge deficit. That is a problem. That is going to catch up with us because it, it, we are not, mm, we're not sustainable that way. We're not resilient that way. Anything goes wrong, if we need money for anything, maybe a war, we won't have it. We'll have to go into huge deficit, even bigger and more and more trillions. So, you know, yes, in, in other times, leave it alone. But Powell's an inclination a little mm -hmm. while ago was we better put some stops on this. Um, I'm very concerned about the economy. You, you, you mentioned something up front in that comment, and that is once you keep reducing your interest rates, you've removed a very important tool from the toolbox. Right. When an economy hits the skids, because now you have only this much. Of, of, of dropping of interest rates uh, you have left in the tank. Way to go from zero. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's talk about, uh, uh, oh, I love this one, climate change for a minute. Is there any question, Cynthia, that we are having climate change on a visible, increasing basis, there like every no day question. this summer? There is no question at all. 
There's so much scientific data that's coming in. They were just this morning, even I saw some scientists going up to Stewart um, yeah, Stewart Glacier so up that. in Alaska, so and, and I've been there, so I know what it used to look like. It's it seems like it's reduced by half. I mean, it's just crazy. They're walking on ground that used to be covered by you know. 300 foot glaciers. I think he said a mile in. A right? mile. It used, it used to be ice, and now they're a mile in before the ice begins. You know, yeah. To start. A mile. It's everywhere. Yeah. So it's, you know, the Arctic is falling apart. Right. The Antarctic is falling apart. Mm -hmm. um, the oceans are rising. So the storms are more frequent and more extreme. Uh, the heat waves are killing people. You know, this week in Qatar, you know, in the Middle East, it went up to 62 centigrade. I went and got a, a, a you know uh, a, a converter. That's 143 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh my! You wear yeah. Zoris on the pavement, the Zoris melt. The bumpers melt off the cars. Oh, 143 is like it's getting to boil. That's what we got now. That has not happened before, and that is clearly climate change. And what is the government doing about that? Can I ask you guys? Nothing. Nothing. Short answer. Nothing. I'll do whatever I want as president. I have the right to do whatever I want. I'm going to keep going back to that quote because the it's world. the beginning of all things. Right, it, right, exactly. Okay, we have, a, we have a little time left to talk about what's going to happen next week. You know, I feel that he's been relatively quiet uh, in the shadow of the mother, uh, you know, the mother testimony this week and all the press commentary about it. Um, but I think it's time for him, just in the, in the sign curve, of, of Trump activity. It's time for him to blow something up for us. And so I suggest to both of you guys, that next week, he's going to do that. We're going to have another shocking uh, resumption of another super negative thread, maybe the border, who knows. Uh, and we're all going to be fascinated with headlines about uh, Trump's, uh, Trump's uh, agenda, because uh, he's going to take the agenda back next time. What do you think? It's going to happen next week. Well, I believe that the whole Epstein thing, because he's directly connected to this guy. And so now, at least in, the, in some of the media anyway, we're seeing the 13-year-old coming out that he raped. Um, and that she's starting to be believed a little bit more now that they can make those connections between Epstein and him. And so I'm thinking that's going to keep growing. So you're right, he has to do something to explode so that we won't pay attention to the Epstein business. Yeah, I mean, it might be a thread that he's played with before, the racism card, the border card, um, who knows what, something really super negative so we can be a real wise guy and get on the front page again. What do you think? Okay, so what's the round robin here? What's hap what haven't we heard from lately? <laughs> right. Venezuela, oh, yeah. <laughs> North Korea. So he'll just pick, well, what's... What haven't I talked about and created havoc with? Oh, yeah, Venezuela. I've done that one for a while. That's what I think is going to happen. Why do you say that? Because there was a piece on NPR as I drove in about Venezuela, about how Trump has been completely unsuccessful in, in dealing with Maduro. And, and what is very interesting is that uh, one of the big oil companies, um, you know, uh, had a permit from the U.S. to operate uh, off or in Venezuela, and the permit was going to expire. Now, if, if Trump really wanted a it have an effect on Venezuela, which makes a lot of money from oil, right? He would not have uh, extended that permit. He did. Yeah. He extended the permit. <laughs> Quietly. Well, <laughs> he wasn't so quiet on NPR. They are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, he's not doing anything about, about uh, Maduro or Venezuela or Guaido, nothing. Well, and the plight of those people. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or except, starving. For, except for making it more difficult for them to come to apply for asylum. Right. Yes, Very that they can't do. Very helpful. Well, yeah, so we'll see. We'll see. That's a good prediction, you guys. Next week, it'll be something international, something global. Be something China, international. North yeah. Korea, maybe something in Europe, Afghanistan, who knows what. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll be another fantastic distraction. Maybe he takes a boat ride with Boris. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Boris. Okay, we should put bets on that. <laughs> okay. Jim Apicella, thank, thank you, you so much. Hey, James. Cynthia, welcome back. Thank you very so much. Nice I to missed see you guys. Yeah. Aloha. Don't forget next Aloha. week. Aloha. I won't forget. <laughs> Aloha.